We are Climate Interactive. My name is Andrew Jones. I am the co-director and co-founder of this nonprofit organization that works closely with MIT Sloan's Sustainability Initiative to develop this workshop and the simulation behind it called En-ROADS. We are a 12-person think tank based here in the United States, but with people in different parts of the world. Here's many of our team. As Bindu just mentioned, uh, she and Ellie are on the call right now. And uh, we're here to really help address this challenge and equity and justice uh, around it. We're funded by a group of uh, foundations, thankful to them for their support. And along the way, as we mentioned, please do write in the box of questions. And uh, if there are longer ones, you can come to our support site. Maybe, uh, Bindu, can you send people that link uh, that people should use if they want to have anything that are longer, longer questions? Um, but I want to go back and just pause at, at this moment to just acknowledge you all coming here today at this time. You have been affected by this current health crisis. You know people who have been even more affected. I like that just to get grounded in the gravity of what's going on in the world right now, that there are significant changes that we're dealing with that make it difficult to show up to think about uh, other questions such as climate change, but also show the gravity of what can change in society and how important it is to prevent future challenges. So please, for just a moment, think of some of those people in your life most affected, and let's really get grounded in the seriousness of this time and to know that the world can shift in really significant ways right now. That's the theme of what we're gonna be exploring, how the world can shift towards preventing future challenges such as this, or exacerbating future challenges such as this. When I say exacerbating both, making it more likely that future global existential threats happen, but also the resilience of our society to bounce back quickly when they do come and to protect the most vulnerable. We are in a very serious moment, so we want us all together to think about how we can play a role in shifting our society towards preventing future existential threats, but also making our society resilient to whatever is coming. And we're going to do it with a conversation really about the economic recovery and the stimulus that's coming out of this health crisis, this economic crisis, and the extent to which it can help or hurt climate into the future. So one part of what we're doing today is that very serious conversation. The other is an offer to you of a tool to think about this and other angles on the climate challenge. And that tool is En-ROADS. It is this simulator. I'm just gonna ask to make sure that uh, Ellie or Bindu, you all can see it right here. Um, are you able to see it okay? Yes. Great. So one part is a serious conversation. The second part is the offer of this tool that we've developed, which is free and available for you to use to engage other people in a serious conversation such as that we're having today. And it is called En-ROADS, and it very quickly can test different futures. I'm making a variety of changes. We're gonna get a chance in a minute to make some of these changes yourself, and it can help see if we take actions, what would be the impact on the future of greenhouse gas emissions and temperature? It is built with our team at MIT Sloan using the best available science. It's been tested against the whole suite of really large, they're called integrated assessment models that are built around the world. Um, all of the reference, excuse me, all of the um, assumptions and equations are shared in a reference guide that's 400 pages long, it's online, it's shareable. And if you don't like the assumptions, many of them are changeable under here, where you can see how would the world be different under a different set of assumptions. So this is our offer to you and to use this model. So I'm gonna step back, two offers, serious conversation, and then also giving you the model. If you're really interested in the model, you could join the Mastering En-ROADS training series. And it is a eight part every week. The next one is Thursday. And the, on Thursday will be our next training uh, where you could learn how to lead the workshop that I'm leading right now. 
If you think, gosh, this would be helpful to show to my city council person, to someone else in my business, to someone else in my NGO community group, someone else at the country level, you could learn how to lead this workshop. Bindu, can you send everybody the link to join? All you need to do is so go, if you're at all interested, just sign up and you'll get emails that say, yeah, next Thursday, here's where the training is. But why we're really here is to have an important conversation about this. So here's how this is gonna work. Think, what in your country, in your city, in your state, wherever you are, what are the current or proposed government, and this is at any level, any country, government responses to the COVID-19 crisis that you think might have a negative effect on preventing the next existential threat around climate? So think and begin writing them into the questions box there in GoToWebinar. So you've read in the newspaper, you've heard from somebody, you've seen the actual proposed legislation. What are the current or proposed government responses that you think would have negative implications? Write it in the questions box within GoToWebinar. Bindu showed you earlier, it's over in the little control panel, the little question thing. Click in there and it'll say questions. Type into it what those are and we're going to um, hear many of them. And what we're going to be doing is saying, if these happened, what would be the effect on climate? But mostly we just wanna see where are you coming from? What are you hearing? And what are the things that are coming up uh, in the world that you are? So um, Bindu, can you read several? And I'm gonna write them down here in my, my notes. Um, what are you seeing, Bindu? Sure. We have a lot of responses coming in. Uh, so here is uh, here it goes. Indiscriminate support for heavy emission sector, example, airline industry. Uh, uh -huh. Huge support of US animal agriculture system that has huge flaws and not working to fix the issues. Avoid public transport, sips personal transport uh, from public to individual. Yep. Gen incentives to renewable energy and maintaining subsidies for fossil fuels. So you said zero, less incentives to renewable energy? Yes, less incentives to renewable energy. And I see a lot of uh, comment on subsidies for fossil fuel and air, airline industries. A lot of people are writing about that. Subsidies to fossil fuel, yep. To and fossil. In, increased use of coal. More coal. Yes, uh, support some industries. And again, here it is uh, auto, aviation, etc., with the same business model and climate impacts support auto industry yep others subsidies to oil company oil company uh-huh bail out fossil fuels more bailing out fossil fuels yep yes this is great uh, you guys keep writing this is great keep writing them down yeah, yeah, again, a lot of people are writing uh, the same thing, mostly about funding of fossil fuel industry, more uh, bailout of oil industries, and uh, encouragement of uh, old normal. And I see no halting deforestation, someone is mentioning. Yes. Subsidies to automobile industry, pressure to get economy back to normal through growth that relies on fossil fuels. More fossil fuel directed growth. Yes, Thank you. more, okay. more waste. Great. Thank you very much. Well, this is terrible news, and this is really helpful here for this exercise. So, um, and I just want to guide everybody. Um, one of the sources, as I ask this question, we've been asking this question of ourselves. Um, we've found that this website uh, from Drilled News. Can you all, can you set, actually, you probably, you might not have this as easily uh, been due. I'm gonna just paste it into the chat box. Um, and here's this website, even at the state level, the country level, uh, this has been a very helpful website. Drilled News has been cataloging many of the actions around the world that uh, really are answering that same question. Okay, so, we're taking a hard, serious look first at uh, well, just the bad news is that there are many forces right now saying, let's use this time to 
reinvest in fossil fuels and where things are going in that direction. And let's see what the implication might be if this were to happen. So to do that, I'm gonna just show you, here is the world that we're gonna be testing. We're gonna be testing in. And the business as usual future that we're exploring it's going from 2000 out to 2100 here in En-ROADS. You can see over on the left, we're starting with the world, really it's dictated by most of the large modeling teams have calculated there's a lot of coal out in the world and there's a lot of um, coal in, in infrastructure, power plants being planned, mining being planned. In that world, this brown line of coal would go up and up and up. Oil would grow and peak around the 2060s and fall slightly, but still grow up a good bit. Here, in blue is natural gas. Renewables are growing steadily, wind and solar. However, still much smaller than coal, oil, and gas. Here's bioenergy in pink, and here's nuclear in blue. If we had all these emissions, and if we had growth, and I'll pull up, you can see this graph shows gross world product in the top left, energy demand growing and going up, if we had all of those drivers of growth, if this is where we got our energy, then the greenhouse gas emissions over on the right would go up and up and up, slowly uh, kind of leveling over time, and then temperature would go up to 4.1 degrees, with the goal, of course, getting well below 2 degrees or all the way down to 1.5. So into this world, let's imagine if we were to tip in this direction of the kind of things that you just listed in the questions box, what might happen? So some of the ones that I heard about, someone mentioned um, bailouts to the auto industry or kind of like helping what's being requested there. So here in the United States, uh, our previous administration, the Obama administration had set a goal of increasing auto efficiency standards up to, I think it was about $50, excuse me, it was gonna be 55, miles per gallon per, per gallon of gas. And the auto industry has said, please change those goals, regulated goals, down to only 40. So don't push us to get much more efficient. So let's explore what that might do if it was adopted all around the world. And we can't say exactly change from 55 down to 40, but to imagine slower progress in what we call energy efficiency in transport. So I'm going to look into that area. Right now, we already are imagining, because of those kinds of improvements of improving, say, to 55 miles to the gallon, um, that the auto, the energy industry of GDP, how much energy it takes to deliver goods and services and people getting where they need to go, is already improving half a percent a year. You can see uh, that assumption underneath here underneath that slider. And so it would be improving throughout the century. You can see the curve in the bottom right coming down. What if it were to improve, not that rate, but a little slower? So I'd like you to think, before hitting the button with En-ROADS, what will happen to this energy mix? Which of these is going to move the most? Coal, oil, gas, renewables? Well, obviously, this is about transport. This is about oil. This, where, which fuels most of our transport around the world. So imagine what would happen. Presumably, this won't go down as much. It might go up a little more and then some change to emissions. So I'm going to move it here to the left. So we'll make a change and I'm gonna hit this button to see what happens again. Watch what happens. There do you see the, the red line of oil goes up a little bit as we expected, as we get um, less efficient. You see the blue line in the bottom right. We don't improve quite as much. I'm going to make it even more strong all the way down here to this level. And we're going to run it again. So watch the change that it makes. I'll hit the button here to replay it several times. You can see more oil, more emissions, particularly in the latter half of the century. And temperature goes from 4.1 up to 4.3. This would hurt future warming and make the world a little less uh, resilient to future changes. 4.3 degrees. Uh, also, did you notice though the brown line change? What was going on there? Coal went up as well. Well, that's because in this future, we're also imagining a good bit of electrification. Um, and actually, uh, you can see that we would have electric vehicles 
more and more in the future. Therefore, those electric vehicles would perhaps get more energy from coal. All right. So this action would hurt overall efforts to prevent future global warming. So the second one that people mentioned, I got here in my piece of paper, people mentioned a uh, good number of bailouts to the, uh, to the um, fossil fuel industry, and in particular coal. Here in the United States, there are regulations for one of the pollutants, mercury, that is an air pollutant that uh, creates health effects for people. The regulations are being weakened because, right now, are being proposed to be weakened, and we're also seeing less enforcement. The um, EPA, the regulatory body here in the United States, um, is being pushed to uh, have a little less regulation of the existing laws. So basically, it would um, if we all oh, the other one that's, that we're seeing, and I think I actually saw some slides on this. I was looking up to see what would be the uh, what the news was covering regarding coal, and um, so here's one some of the, one headline from uh, Reuters, Asia's pandemic stimulus could slow the demise of coal. And in China, weighs a $7 trillion stimulus plan includes coal-fired power plant projects. So perhaps even more coal. And here was the news from High Country News. The Trump administration sprints to weaken environmental protections during the pandemic. And the EPA suspends enforcement of environmental laws, says the LA Times. So if this were to happen, and we need to take this really seriously because it is afoot right now. What if we had even more coal? So I'm going to add on top of less transportation efficiency improvements. What if we were to imagine more, more support to coal? So I'm going to imagine in this case, what is it in fact a subsidy? This is in dollars per tons carbon equivalent. Watch the um, brown line. Of course, that would be the one affected. But think, how would this affect things? What do you expect? this blue line to do, what temperature might go up to, if we were to imagine even more coal. So I boosted it up. If we imagine even more coal, watch that brown light of coal go up just a little bit. It wasn't enough. Well, here's emissions. You can see greenhouse gas net emissions go up just a little bit. It wasn't enough to push it up 0.1 degree Fahrenheit, but still is another thing that is pushing up temperature in the long term. One of the others I saw that's happening a good bit in, in, uh, in Brazil is to imagine more deforestation. Uh, right now we're imagining it to be flat. It could actually go up. And you can imagine a country such as Brazil saying, in order for it to have more, more economic development, we would increase the amount of deforestation. Uh, would energy change? So emissions over here aren't gonna change, of course. But over here, watch the emissions from deforestation if we imagine more, then that would push it up. And I know, well, I'm trying to imagine, was there another big area, Bindu, that you saw? I guess, yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. What was another one? Some people, uh, many people were writing about the agriculture waste emissions and especially from burning of the agriculture residues. Burning of agricultural residues. And um, really, if it's going to, well, there's two effects here. One of them would be part of deforestation where you're burning forests in order to create agricultural land, which we just did. Um, I think that would be the main one that we would have here, but also if it were to take a, a pull on, like if it were to reduce the efforts to cut emissions in the agricultural sector, then we could imagine some of these other gases going up a little bit over here with methane and other. I'm looking to the others that were mentioned. Um, well, bail out to oil companies. And really, it, I just find it hard to go down this road and really look at these possible futures, but it should be taken seriously. Let's do it. More bailout to oil could push us up a little bit and actually less encouragement of renewables. So watch the green line in the top left. If we had less of renewables, so watch the green line in the top left. Okay, I think that's enough. We face a possible response right now that could shift in the wrong direction. Now, I'm not here saying that my calculation here at Climate Interactive is that the temperature would go up to 4.6 degrees instead of 4.1. We can't say that with this kind of precision. What we can say is that if we were to weaken the improvement on energy efficiency and transport, 
pull away from um, improvements in renewables, have more subsidies to coal and oil and increase deforestation, the impact would be more greenhouse gas net emissions, more temperature into the future. So just as we imagine important initiatives coming out of this time, stopping the, the pulling back of good progress is one important thing that would be necessary to address climate change into the future. How do we make sure that many of these things don't happen? Okay, we've taken a hard look at this dark future. I'm gonna hit a really good button that we've put here. See this? Reset policy to the previous assumptions. It's really great. Watch what happens here. Okay, let's clean the slate. Just let it go. <laughs> now we're gonna start with a base future again. Here we are imagining a different kind of future a different kind of future. So let me go back over here to some other slides. I'm gonna let that go. There are other futures that are possible. Trend is not destiny. So here's our second question to you. What are any responses to the COVID-19 crisis that you think would have positive climate implications? What are things that we've learned during this time that could be helping, that actually could help much more into the future. What are habits? What are policies? What are ways of working? What are being, ways of being? What are some legislation that's being discussed? Business policy, personal policy, answer in the questions box. Um, as you know, perhaps, uh, this has been a remarkable time and we have just shown you, we've just seen, I have a, a slide of it, I know somewhere here. Uh, I said, we saw an interesting graph. And please write in the questions box right now, answering that question. But here is global CO2 emissions, 1990 to the present. Here is what emissions were last year, all the way up here above 35. We're expected this year to have 5% lower emissions. See the red line, the red dot here? See that? This is a graph from BBC. 5% lower. Are there actions that seem that may actually continue? So Bintu, uh, what are you seeing? I'm gonna get another piece of paper here. Uh, what are the actions and policies that may um, actually help in the future? What are ones that you're yeah. seeing? A lot of responses are coming and uh, mostly uh, people are vouching for two things, two positive things. One is uh, more working from home and less commute. So people in this uh, regard, people are saying that uh, cleaner air, less pollution, uh, less and more responsible tourism. Uh, the next is uh, people are saying uh, more support to locally grown food and less emissions from the food, uh, food systems, a local sourcing of goods, particularly agriculture, less focus on uh, yeah. for diet. So more switch to plant-based diet, uh, doing stuff online, more virtual meetings, less travel, travel restrictions, uh, put a price on coal, uh, air quality would improve due to less transportation. Yeah. Uh, in investment in renewables, reduced reliance on private transport, a more working from home and uh, fewer uh, international flights. Yes. Decrease, decreasing our use of auto, planes and other fossil fuels transports, reduced air travel, uh, stopping uh, moving around frequently and being more efficient uh, travel-wise. Yeah. Stimulate economy through renewables rollout. Great. Other? Do you see others that are focusing on on policy? We want to. With there been many on like individual behavior. What about broad public policy? Do you see others? Uh, people are. Area? Yeah, people are saying uh, canceling fossil fuel uh, stimulus that uh, are there, remove fossil fuel subsidies, uh, tax rebates for electric cars. Wow. Put in actual price for using carbon. Pricing on carbon. Yes. Great, wow. Okay, this has been great. Keep, keep writing, keep imagining. One important thing we get to do at this time is to imagine and think about some of these possibilities and share them with each other and um, share these possibilities with the world. So here we are. Uh, let's let's test some of these. Um, and as we enter this world, there's 
the excitement about many of the possibilities, and then there's the importance of choosing the ones that are the highest leverage. And I want us to just, I'm gonna start with one uh, that I thought was pretty interesting someone mentioned is uh, electric cars and electric vehicles. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna start with that. And here we wanna have a really critical eye about what would be needed to really make a big dent in emissions in the future. So the way you would test this, and um, actually we'll send the, actually, Vindu, why don't you just go ahead and send people the link to the model so that they can be testing some of this in parallel if they'd like. Can you just send the link to the model itself? I will send you, oh, I didn't do it before. I should have sent, yeah, let's send you that, well, that, that worst case scenario. I wanted to send you as well. Here's what we had before. I'm gonna um, increase deforestation and the coal and the gas and less transport. I think we had less methane. You know, we had more methane than others. This is the scenario I had before. I'll just show you what, what we're able to do and what you can do on Twitter or elsewhere is when you make a scenario like this, and this is not the one to share, this is the bad news scenario, but you can just go to share it on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or email. I'm gonna copy this scenario and I'm gonna just put it into uh, the chat box here and send it to you. You can go look at this bad news scenario um, and check it out yourself. I'm gonna reset it. And now we're going to explore what I was just talking about with electric vehicles. And I want you to imagine, imagine we had many more electric vehicles around the world. And don't think of just the United States and Europe, but in India and China, Indonesia, South Africa, Mexico, Brazil. Um, if we had a big boost in electric vehicles, how that might change where we get our energy, how much energy we do use, and then also what the emissions would do in temperature. And the way we test that is we look over here under transport electrification, it's already growing up to about 20%. What if we imagined much more? Which of these lines would move? And I hope you think, okay, the idea of it is we have less internal combustion engines. So the red line of oil would move the most. So we're gonna watch that line move down. I hope as I test it, hope the model hasn't changed in the last week since I tried this, but we're gonna increase this. And but before I do, imagine what you think the temperature might go to. If we were to have rapid, say 70% electric vehicles in the latter half of the century. That temperature of 4.1 might go down where? So think, think, think. Say that number to yourself, 4.0, 3.5, 3.0, 2.5, 2.0. What might it go down to? I'm gonna crank it up. And here we see the result. I'm gonna replay it and watch just to make sure it did what it did. Bottom right corner, electric share leaps all the way up to about 68% over in the bottom right. You saw that. Top left corner, look here at the red line of oil, less oil, but emissions go down only a little bit. See the blue line drops just a little bit. Temperature 4.1 down to just 4.0. Now this, the first time I saw it when Lori Siegel, our lead modeler, sent me this result, I was like, the model was wrong. Something is wrong here because electric vehicles are great. They are gonna help us a lot on climate. But then I looked and she pointed me towards what's going on in this complex system. The world is asking for more electricity. Where does the world get more electricity? Well, in this world of inexpensive coal and inexpensive gas, it's getting it from coal. So watch the brown line of coal. Um, the brown line of coal is going up. It's compensating for the changes that we get and the improvements we get. Now, we also are getting more wind and solar, but absent incentives for wind and solar, such as carbon price or saying, okay, we are going to have more wind and solar, it doesn't help quite as much. So we're seeing in this complex system how some policies are going to need to couple with others. Electric vehicles on their own without what we call decarbonizing the grid, without adding wind and solar or cutting out uh, sources like coal and gas, we're not likely to get the same kind of impact. So I wanted you to just really have some serious precision about what 
combinations of policies are necessary, but also to keep directing us towards what's really going to help a good bit. All right, so there's just one test on electric vehicles. Let's look at some others that we're seeing. The ones that we saw the most that you wrote in the questions box was really about transportation and the fact that so many people are working from home, so many people are traveling less. Is it possible that we're able to get things done, get the access to places that we need, get access to goods and services without traveling so much? We would call that an improvement to the energy efficiency of the transport system. Over here, I showed you this before, it's already improving at half a percent a year. What if it improved faster? So we're gonna increase this. Now imagine, what's this gonna do? Just as we saw before, when it got worse, the red line went up, oil, we had more oil. Well, if it got better, I'm gonna increase it a good bit, not half a percent a year, but 2.8% a year. Maybe we'll try it up even higher. What if it went up 4.4% a year? Watch the red line in the top left less oil. The world over time needs less oil. Now, it doesn't happen just immediately. What you have is the changing of infrastructure that takes some time to get rid of, like the fact that we don't need as many vehicles, perhaps, or we're going to be building up public transportation systems. We're going to be building up our capacity to work remotely steadily over time, not just this one-time change, but to have that continue throughout the rest of the century you can see the energy intensity of GDP, the blue line in the bottom right corner goes down faster. It takes less energy to deliver goods and services in the transportation sector, less oil, little less coal as well, and it goes down from 4.1 to 3.9. This is an important improvement if we were able to sustain these changes throughout the century. So there's one important change that you mentioned. I'm gonna look here to your list and see what are some of the other things that were mentioned. Um, people mentioned the second one that I heard was local food, local food and more sustainably produced food. So local food, really one effect is back in transport. So here we were imagining less commuting and people flying around less, but if food is produced locally, we would have less shipping around the world. Maybe we can increase that a little bit more. I'm gonna increase that a little bit more, up to 4.8% a year. But also over here in um, methane and other gases. So underneath here, you can see that we split this up into two areas, agricultural and waste emissions and energy and industry emissions. So more plant-based diets, more locally produced food. These uh, produce less emissions of nitrous oxide, often less methane. So I'm going to increase those. Watch what happens. Um, Overall in the bottom right, non-CO2 emissions, you can see if there were a big change, this is 42% of the way be between business as usual and what has been calculated as the maximum improvements that are possible. This makes a big difference. It went all the way down to 3.6. These other gases matter a lot. And I'm gonna show you a graph that illuminates it really well. Um, I'll go back. See this little button right here shows us before that change, before that change, this blue area, uh, this is the stacked graph of greenhouse gases. Actually, I'll just take a step back and show you from the bottom. This is adding on top of each other all of the gases that are producing the warming that we see. This green area is land use CO2 from deforestation, the conversion of forests into agricultural land. On top of it, it's for burning coal, oil, and gas, and biofuels. You see all of that black area. Uh, the biggest sources, of course, burning coal, oil, and gas. It's already a little bit lower because of our energy efficiency. On top of it are the F gases, HFCs, SF6, fluorinated gases. On top of that is methane. So I'm gonna, you can see, and then on top on nitrous oxide. Methane is big. That is a thick band there in blue. So I'm gonna do, redo that change. You can see it shrink. When it shrinks like that, it goes from 3.9 temperature up to 2100, all the way down to 3.6. So I'm going to uh, undo that. Actually, let me just go under here and show that change, 3.6. So it goes all the way down to 3.6. Those changes really matter a lot. I'm gonna look at your list again. People uh, said- Drew, yeah, go ahead, Bindu. 
Yeah, there are two points coming in very frequently. One is a carbon price, put a carbon price. Uh, and the next one is uh, subsidies for energy efficiency of buildings and industries. Many people have written for these two points. Great. Thank you, Bindu. All right. Pricing carbon, energy efficiency in buildings and in industry. Let's go to pricing carbon right now. Why is temperature going up so much, even though we've had these two actions? Mostly because of this brown area of energy CO2. What if we were to have perhaps a carbon fee and dividend? That would be that whenever anything that has that's been produced with coal oil, and gas is a bit more expensive. Um, of course, it would disproportionately affect coal because coal is so carbon dense. And uh, what if this were to spread around the world? There are now about 40 national and subnational entities that have a price on carbon, some cities, many cities in China, some countries, particularly in Northern Europe. Let's test what would happen there and think what would happen to the energy mix if we were to have a carbon price? You can place a carbon price very simply here. Underneath it, you could set an exact carbon price, but let's just keep it simple and just imagine a high carbon price. What's gonna change the most? So think, which of these lines? Say to yourself, which line is gonna move the most? Is it gonna affect coal, oil, gas? What's gonna happen to the green line of renewables? Again, this is not an answer machine. This is a tool to improve your thinking and learning. So mental, uh, simulate your mental model first, and we're going to increase, actually, I won't just do it indiscriminately. I'm gonna go over here and say, what if it was $100 a ton? So watch and think $100 a ton, there's the change. We'll play it again. What's the biggest change? Coal, look at the brown line of coal, it goes down and not in the 2040s and the 2050s, it goes down quite quickly. Why? Because this is getting put into place very soon and it leads us to not even, to not continue to invest in coal infrastructure as much in the future. It also affects the blue line of natural gas. See the blue line go down a little less oil. $100 a ton is only in the United States, 90 cents on a gallon of gas. So it doesn't change overall use of oil as significantly. So oil doesn't change quite as much. But look over on the right, temperature goes down from 3.6 all the way down to 2.9. It has a very large effect. We also can see what happens to wind and solar, the green line goes up. Now one challenge with this, of course, would be if that happened, what would happen to energy prices and how do people react? And it's important to think about the whole system here. Um, the cost of energy we calculate would go up. What do we do about the fact that energy would get more expensive before it started to get a little less expensive? But this means that energy is more, more expensive. How do we make sure this doesn't disproportionately affect the most vulnerable people in their electricity bills? And their transportation costs so that people can still get around. And this is some of the art of how such a policy would be put into place. And it leads us to have conversations about what happens to all of the revenue that would come from this carbon price. Here we calculate $3.6 trillion of revenue. So some of the proposals we've seen, Citizen Climate Lobby is talking about this, would have a dividend back to citizens so that people would get a check every year so that they would get money back. So they'd be spending more money at the pump, the gas pump, or at their electric bill, but they'd be getting this check. And many calculations are showing that those two things could balance each other out, that that revenue could go back there. Now, mind you, there's also debates. Many of the oil companies say this money should go to them uh, or coal companies. Um, also governments say, oh, we should use it to close deficits. This is some of the debate, but this is some of what should be considered when you think about the whole system effect of such policies. I'm gonna go back to uh, look at this, but overall we can see how a carbon price could get us down much lower and an even higher one, of course, would help even more getting this down to 2.7 degrees. So given the fact that many countries are talking about economic stimulus, there could be the potential of this kind of policy bringing dividends and being stimuluses for people, checks to individuals to get economies going through 
a carbon price. Um, so those were the two. That was the one you talked about, carbon pricing. What was the second one, Bindu? I'm, I've forgotten. What was another one that we haven't touched yet that people have been? It was uh, energy efficiency in building and industry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's look in that area. And again, one thing you just saw, there's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. We're not trying to figure out which of these policies is the one. Because you've just saw, I just put in a fairly high carbon price. A fairly high, high carbon price is not enough on its own to solve this challenge. It seems the more we test it, I've already changed methane and other emissions from agriculture, energy efficiency and transport, and a carbon price, and we're at 2.7 degrees. And I can imagine really high carbon prices that, that get us clo closer to two, but they don't get us all the way. We're, ha we're seeing that there's no, there's no silver bullet. It takes more than one seed to plant a garden. It takes more than one seed to plant a garden. Someone on Twitter, put that out there to the world. The world needs to know. It's going to take more than one seed to plant the garden that will get us to well below two degrees. And another one would be the effort at energy efficiency is in our buildings and in our industry, insulation, motors, appliance standards, uh, conservation, turning off lights, better ma machines to control the use of our electricity in buildings. There's so much that can be done now. Let's explore what that would do. It's already improvement. You can see 1.2% a year is what the base level of improvement is. But look over on the bottom right. Already we have improvements to the energy intensity of GDP. Why is that improving already? Well, what's going on in this complex system is higher prices for energy is already are already leading people to get more efficient. I didn't show you this before, but one of the impacts of that carbon price, actually, I'll pull it up here. Um, I think, see if it shows, if it works here, um, you can see it moves a little bit. As you have a higher carbon price, you can see the blue line in the bottom right corner. Higher costs of energy lead people to get more efficient. This is being driven internally within the system and we've modeled it as such. Okay, what if we though we had more improvements in this area? I'm going to increase those changes, um, not 1.2% a year, now to 3.8, and that helps a little bit more. You see, we need a lot less energy. We're here at 2.5 degrees. So now, here we're at 2.5. I'm going to actually send you this scenario. So if you're here and you want to try for yourself to see what else would be needed. So anybody, oh, I'm pulled up the questions box. Um, I'm going to send you this scenario, so try it yourself. Go and check it out and see um, in your chat box is a link. Open that link and you can see this 2.5 degrees scenario. So let's think you could try it yourself or guess. What else needs to be done? One of the things that you suggested in the questions box was less subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. You already had a carbon price, but imagine if this were a time to say, okay, we're going to push even more on coal and see the brown line go down, less on oil and natural gas as well. That gets us down a little bit lower, 2.4 degrees. This is also a time now that we've decarbonized when electrification might be able to help. If we do decarbonize the grid, and you can see, see the green line go up, look how much we've gotten. Uh, a, a renewable energy to go up. We could imagine it actually, this would be a time to encourage it even more. Um, I think we can actually look and see how much we've succeeded at that. I haven't shown this in a while, but um, what if we were to see how much we have that's renewables? There are many graphs in here that you can explore. Um, this is, I know it's in here. Uh, final energy demand, percent electricity consumption, from renewables percent look at that 74 percent of our energy coming from renewables in this scenario 74 percent 100 percent renewables is a great goal but when you model the whole complex system you'll see it's difficult to get to a full 100 percent but 74 percent would be a lot and here we are all the way all the way up here at um down to 2.3 degrees 
Okay, I'm going to pull back where we were to see where we were before. Okay, what we're doing is we're encouraging renewables. I said, would electrification help? Now with a decarbonized grid, it would help even more. And now we get down to 2.2 degrees. Um, what if we were to use this time to cut deforestation? People talked about changes in agriculture. And then also other measures to take this time to recommit ourselves to biodiversity. Of course, we know that some of the pressures that we put on natural systems decreases their resilience. Uh, one of the reasons that we have challenges like pandemics is that nature becomes less resilient the more that we put pressure on it. That is one of the key creators of challenges of pandemics or create the creators of them. So what if we were to have more growing of trees and more increase of biodiversity? Watch this 2.1 degree would get us down to two degrees. Um, there are also some potentials such as like agricultural soil carbon, better agricultural practices. I'm going under this area of technological carbon removal. Um, ag soil carbon, you can see here, what if we were to have a good bit more of that? Watch the two degrees go down to 1.9. It's interesting, look at this graph over here I showed you before of all of the emissions stacked on top of each other. You can see they're falling down so much. And the area below zero is now removals. You may have heard of carbon dioxide removal. See this gray area? That is actually from agricultural soil carbon. And you can watch it grow. See that gray, gray area grow as we drop from two degrees down below it to 1.9 degrees. Okay, I'm just gonna pause there for just a second. 1.9 degrees, we've gotten and we were at 4.1. We explored a scenario that pushed us all the way up to 4.5 degrees. And then I said, what are the actions that are coming out of this time that could actually get us down to well below two? And we've put together one scenario. I'll send it to you so that you can play with it yourself. We'll go into, uh, I'm gonna just send it into the, uh, the chat box right here. There it is for you to go check out. But I'd like you to just pause and just take a breath with this scenario. Here we are with a possibility, an entirely possible future. I said before, you can't plant a garden with one seed. This is a garden with many seeds planted, with uh, more disincentives to more coal, oil, and gas, a carbon price, encouraging of renewables, more energy efficiency in the transport sector by changed behaviors that we've seen of less travel, but also more public transportation, um, and in buildings and industry, more electrification in those sectors as well. Electrify everything, as Dave Roberts wrote recently. Less deforestation, less emissions from the agricultural sector, growing more trees and more carbon removal. Imagine this possibility. And I'd like to ask you just for a second to think. We're going to be silent for 60 seconds. And I'd like you to think, what would you love about being part of a world that was making this happen? What would you personally love? to be part of a community of people around the world doing whatever they can to make a scenario like this happen. We're gonna be silent for 60 seconds. I'm pulling up my phone here to make sure we do it really for 60 seconds because you'll see it's a long time. So I'm gonna pull my stopwatch up. 60 seconds, be silent. What would you love about being part of this kind of world?
Okay, that was 60 seconds. Please write in your box, questions box. Um, please write in your question box your answers. We'd love to just hear from some of you. What would you love about being part of a world that is making this kind of scenario happen? Write in your question box right now. We'd love to hear from as many people as possible. Um, Bindi, are you getting answers yet? Yeah, we already have a lot of great uh, responses coming in. So thank you, everyone. So Alice writes, happy. And uh, knowing that we solved this giant problem, we can do it. Uh, what I would like, so a mental model shift from consumerism and material things to quality of life and consciousness, that would make a world of difference. Responsible consumption, less transportation, greater biodiversity. Oh, uh, this is so great, Bindu. These are so great. Slow down just a little bit. Let's just enjoy this a little <laughs> bit. So slow down how you're speaking. Yeah, read them a little more slowly and keep going because this is fantastic. And keep writing it, everybody. Go sure. Ahead. The, yeah, there are so many great responses. I'm just overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. So conscious existence within our communities. Uh, there would be hope for my children. Yes. Less inequality. Yes. Less anxiety about mine and my children's future. A yes. much greener world. Yes. More clean jobs. More clean jobs. Yep. Hope. Great. That is the, that is the old in my dreams. Climate Thanks. justice. Climate justice. Common goal and hopeful purpose. Fantastic. A planet that was whole and a world that is safe for everyone. Great. Thank you. Less inequalities. Wow, these are great. I'm reading them as they come in, and this is really great. So what we're encouraging us all to do is to imagine this possibility, what we would love about it, and then to really think this next question, which is, okay, given that, um, what's the next right thing for you to do? And I'll note that along the way, I know when I start imagining this kind of positive future, there's a voice in my head that comes up and says, oh, it can't happen. Um, and note, you can have questions about the scenario. And of course, I'm, I hope you're writing them into the question box and we'll answer many of your questions about uh, the analysis that we've done behind that scenario we just did. But for a moment, let's spend some time in this possibility that this could happen and to think about what role you could play in doing it in helping to make ha making it happen. So I ask the question this way, what is the next right thing for you to do? What feels like the action that you can take at whatever domain, at whatever level you have power, whether it is your family or your social media world or your business or your community or your state or your country or an NGO, an organization that you're part of that's trying to pass some of the policies that we've been exploring. And I'm not saying uh, what's, it doesn't need to be huge. It just needs to be something. What feels like the next right thing for you to do? Of course, in parallel, we're inviting you to, if you'd like to be someone who presents this tool, this is one of the interventions that's possible in the world. What feels like the next right thing for you to do? Answer in your question box as well. What, what feels like the next right thing for you to do? Bindi, what are you seeing as answers? Yeah, a lot of uh, them. So vote and the next, our friend from Cecil is writing, uh, taking, already taking Enros training and getting more people involved with CCL, Citizens Climate Great. Lobby, uh, uh -huh. get support for carbon pricing, driving, driving electric car. I see one here, robust data gathering and data management. Another nerd in the team. We love it. Great. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Being vegan, being vegetarian. Uh huh. Share errors. Share errors. Yes. Support biodiversity. Uh, get more people involved. Join climate justice group. Start to grow my own food. Telecommuting. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. 
so many uh, advocate for a carbon price join citizen climate lobby advocate for the right of new generations to live fantastic okay yeah. well this is really the punchline of all this kind of the arc of where we've taken you today remember of all the changes that could send us in the wrong direction imagining the ones that could take us in a better direction for climate what they add up to what you would love about it what you're going to do about it now one of the things that is possible for how you might if you might do about it of course we're offering is that if you think that sitting or through online workshops is it'd be a powerful way for you to engage other people we'd love to train you in how to lead this session to do exactly what bindu ellie and i are doing today and note you could do it we have over a hundred people around the world who are currently um been trained in this whole series of programs and can um, teach other people, excuse me, and engage other people with this tool. So uh, Bindu, can you send people that link that's at the bottom here? We call it the Mastering En-ROADS training series. It's every Thursday. So the next one is in two days. And in two days, is it happens to be the training in how to do what I just did with you. So it'll be a one hour training. There's one at this time in the morning here in the US, one in the afternoon to teach you all of it you need to know about the model, what you need to know about facilitation, doing it online. Um, so please follow that link if you'd like to join us. Um, if you don't, well, hopefully this has been a time for you to really explore what's possible, what role you want to play as a climate leader wherever you are in the world. I think we're about up to the time of the hour. Uh, here's some information. Uh, We'd love it if you took screenshots of the session or have a reaction to the session on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Uh, here is En-ROADS. This is me. This is uh, at Andrew P. Jones is me, but Climate Interact, hashtag En-ROADS. Do share whatever you do come up with. And when you make a scenario, we saw, we showed you before how you can share that scenario to the world. And of course, all of the information is here at enroads.org. Um, we didn't get the time really to answer many of your questions. Uh, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna stay on the line for a few minutes and see the questions that did come up. Um, if you had others, of course, we sent you the site for where you can um, look up, excuse me, where you can send us the answer, excuse me, send us your questions, we can answer them. Um, actually, so, before we shift over there, I think we're just going to formally close. So overall, what we just saw here, there are powerful scenarios in the future that you can be part of to avoid the next existential threat facing our society and bring positive benefits in the near term as well. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna be worth it. Go get them everybody, bye-bye.